Buenos días. Can you tell what language that is? That's not Swedish. <laughs> so, buenos días. What is it? Spanish, right. So, um, I wish I could do this in Swedish today, but I can't. Um, so, you, English will have to do. Um, I want to start by thanking the National Center for Swedish as a Second Language for this wonderful opportunity to be here with you today. Um, I am particularly pleased to be here today with my husband, Ricardo Tegui, uh, and uh, with a doctoral student who's been a teacher and who has really made the work, the theoretical work, into practice, Kate Seltzer, and she will be speaking a little later, so it's really wonderful to be here with you. Um, and uh, there are a few people that have really made this possible, and I want to make sure that we thank them. Um, so, of course, Karen Sanwall, who introduced me, Aina um, Bigensten, who has always been so forthcoming, Monica Axelson, uh, Pavi Opaivi, Jubona, and many, many more whose name I can't mention. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Um, so, I want to start today, let's see if I can do this, right? Right, I want to start today by reminding you of why we're all here. We're here because you want to learn more about how to teach Swedish as a second language to children, to adolescents, and to adults. I want to remind you that I come with a set of lenses. My lenses are, fortunately or unfortunately, those of the work that I do in the United States. I came to the United States uh, from Cuba at the age of 11. I have lived in the United States my whole life, in New York City, to be exact. And um, my work is shaped by that experience. Uh, I start always by saying this, because I do work internationally a lot, and even within New York City, uh, Kate and I work with teachers all the time, and one of the things we always tell them is that they have to make this work fit for them in their schools. Every school is different. Uh, every society is different. So what I tell you today, uh, think of how you may be able to apply it here, but do not take it as a whole, because I think there are differences, and we want to think, and teachers have to be reflective about this. So the, what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit is I want to think about what we have been doing in language education. I want to think about where we're going with all of this. And then I'm going to then step into two classrooms with two teachers, look at what we're calling their translanguaging pedagogy, think of their practices. And again, I want to remind you that those are US situations, even though I think that the theoretical perspective is applicable worldwide. So I want to remind you that uh, the traditional conceptions of language and language education, what we have all been taught is that languages and cultures are boxes. They're autonomous, bounded concepts, right? And we think of speakers as being idealized native language speakers. And we think of languages that have to be acquired as being second languages. So one of the things we're going to do today together is try to move away from those positions that all of us have held for so long. Because I think the question that we want to ask ourselves is why? Why have we boxed languages and why have we boxed cultures in the way in which we have? and to realize that what we're doing is we are managing differences. And then think of what are the consequences of managing these differences. The traditional conceptualizations of language education is basically that we do what is called subtractive bilingualism for those that we consider others, right? So we take their languages away. But then for those who are supposed to belong, we add the other language. I'm always marveled at the fact that in all Scandinavian countries, I can speak in English, and you all feel 
that it's great, right? So I think we want to think about how it is that for all of us is great and for others it is not. And this is, uh, I bring my experience, this is work that I've done in Chiapas, the southernmost province of Mexico, where of course the idea is that these children who speak two Mayan languages, Sotzil and Celtal, have to be uh, taught in Spanish only because the idea is that Spanish is a language that is going to give them access to society without realizing that they're being taught in classrooms in which there is no floor and where, as you see, water comes in when it rains, right? And with very poor resources. So this idea that for the others, what we do is we take something away without giving them anything uh, in return. Whereas, of course, this is a, a, a classroom in Australia, uh, in a French-English uh, classroom, whereas for the elite, what we have is additive bilingualism with a lot of resources, two teachers, etc. So one of the things we have to remember is that the traditional goal of second language teaching has always been uh, to uh, teach language to others who are really not meant to participate meaningfully in society, as if it's going to be a second language, but even to our own, sometimes we think of adding a linguistic and cultural identity, but we think that the identity and the language that we have could be left undisturbed. And one of the things we want to do today is problematize these notions that we have held for so long. <clears throat> so, our pedagogy, our practices are all, of course, uh, notions that are predicated on these conceptualizations of language and who we should teach and why. And so we have uh, developed pedagogies of separation, always keeping the other language away from, in my case, English, in your case, probably Swedish, right? Complete separation. And based on the concept of the sociolinguistic concept of diglossia, that one language is always spoken in one place and the other language is then moved further and further away from the places of prestige to the home or other places where it's not supposed to come together, right? So all our practices, all our pedagogies, traditional pedagogies, are really reinforcing this idea that our linguistic practices have to be kept together. But the question that I think we have to ask ourselves is that the world has turned completely, right? Um, and I think what we really have to wonder is the world has turned, language education has not always turned or changed, and we want to ask ourselves, why not? So just to remind ourselves, how has the world turned, right? So the world has turned because we are, after all, immersed in this neoliberal economic regime, which our colleague David Harvey has defined as having two elements. One is the deregulation of markets, which of course means privatization. And the other one is what he calls deterritorialization, the idea that the spaces have become interconnected, that there's a lot of transnational circulation, not only of goods, but also of people, because of course technology has made these transnational circulations possible. And of course the idea that there is, there is more and more migration and displacements as a result of war and as a result of uh, economic possessions, right, that come into being. So the world has turned, and with that, of course, one of the things that has happened is that we have started to break out of this box in which language education had been held captive, right? So how, was, uh, how are these breaking outs occurring? Well, one of the things that is happening is that many marginalized communities 
have really started to question the idea that why should they be giving up their languages? Why is this other language, dominant language, being imposed? Why can't we have the same as everybody else? So that is one part. And the other part is that the powerful, the elite, have also broken out of our national borders, right? So the ad concept of additive bilingualism, that we have one language and the other language can be added whole, no longer holds. And you, of course, here in the European Union have developed this idea of plurilingualism, which connotes already that we're not talking about additive bilingualism because we are not talking about just one language to which another one is added, but some more intermingling of the language resources. So all of this breaking out, of course, leads us to another perception of bilingualism, neither subtractive nor additive, but, but dynamic, right? And this is an image that I have used in a book uh, on bilingual education in the 21st century. It's a banyan tree. I use this image for many purposes. I use this image because it's one tree, one person, of course, but there are com um, complexities and multiplicity of language practices. And if you recognize the temple at the bottom, that's the Angkor Wat Temple in Cambodia, uh, of course, it's the banyan tree that is holding the temple whole, otherwise it would fall apart. And I use that image to think of the fact that for children, if we do not, and for language minoritized children, if we do not acknowledge their complex language practices, their temple, which is a child of course, will be completely crumbled. So, so one of the things that we really have to think about is that this idea of dynamic bilingualism has really reshaped our conceptualizations of what second language education should be. One is to think of the fact that we're really not talking about adding a second language, but what we're talking about is about incorporating new language features and practices into the existing repertoire of the child, right? And the other idea, of course, is that all of this happens through social interaction, right? It doesn't happen by itself. It's not a box that you can add. It's not forms that you just add. It's not a box. It, is, it happens in interaction in the classroom, in the affordances and opportunities that you give the children to interact. So <laughs> I think that one of the questions that I want you to think about is whether really learners can acquire a second language as a self-contained system. And of course, my answer is no, and I want you to think about it. And I bring you an example of two five-year-old English language learners. That is a term that we use in the United States. Not a good term, don't use it, but it is a term that we use. Um, and these are speakers of Spanish in a bilingual classroom. You know, of course, in the United States, we have a very large Spanish-speaking population and immigrants who come every day. So uh, this is two little children for the first time coming uh, to school, to an English-speaking school, and trying to make sense of what is going on. And the question for you as I read these two cases is, what are the children doing? So, okay. So this is uh, a study I did, and uh, one day the teacher has taken out these kindergarten children, they're five-year-olds, outside, and I'm sitting next to a little five-year-old, they are sitting on the floor, uh, on the ground, and Alicia, the teacher, is at, she's, the teacher is thinking she's teaching comparatives and superlatives, right? So the teacher is going, that tree is bigger, that tree is smaller, and she's repeating all of this. And Alicia is trying it out under her breath, right? You know, if you've ever 
taught little children, you know, they all talk to themselves all the time, right? So she's trying it out uh, under her breath, and she comes out by, with, this tree is, and she can't remember bigger, but she says, is grander, right? So that's one example. Other example is that same class. Uh, this is now snack time. And Adolfo is in this class. Adolfo has just come from Mexico a few months before. And uh, he is now looking out the window, and he realizes that it's raining. So he's again talking to himself. He looks up, and he says, está lloviendo mucho, right? But then he realizes some of the students in that, in this, uh, on the ta at the table are not going to be really able to understand him. So he says, look, it's washing. There's washing afuera. Hmm? So what I want you to think about now is what are these English language learners doing? I, um, what I want to argue is that they're not just simply adding English a whole autonomous language to their Spanish. That's not what they're doing. What they're doing is they are using their own language features, what they already know, in interrelationship with new ones in order to make sense, right? So in interrelationship, not separately. And what they're doing is they're not adding another language, they are constructing this bilingual repertoire, this repertoire of features, by adding those features and integrating them to the ones that they already have, okay? So what I want you to remember is these children are not just code switching, right? Code switching refers to going from one national language to another national language. Maybe from an external perspective, we can say that this is what they're doing. But for, if you take the, um, the viewpoint of the learner, of the speaker, right? In this case, these children, right? The, what you're getting is not going from one language to another, but simply trying to use all these uh, rep uh, features of their repertoire to make meaning and, of course, extend then their repertoire. So it's very, very different from thinking that they're going from one language to another, because they're not. What they're doing is they're using all their resources, all the features that they already have in their repertoire, and then in interrelationship with the new ones, extending that repertoire. And I came to this, and this is what we're going to talk about as translanguaging, again, because I think you learn a lot more from being in classrooms, as you all are, than from reading books. And one day, I was sitting in a bilingual classroom with fifth graders, and they were talking about their use of English and their use of Spanish. And one child said to me, even though Spanish runs through my heart, English rules my veins. And I really thought about this, and I thought, well, if this is the case, this child is telling me that what he is building is a whole system, one system, right? You cannot separate the blood from the heart from the, the blood uh, going through the veins. You can't do that. So what we're talking about is we're talking about one language system, and if we separate, what we have is death, right? Because you cannot then allow this system to, <coughs> to work properly. I'm, I'm going to just play for you. It's uh, only 30 seconds. Um, but um, this is how one bilingual, um, one bilingual author explains Let's see. Um, let's play from there. Oops. Wait. Okay. Okay. This is this takes practice. Let's see. Maybe maybe from here. So this is what he's talking the way the, the way that he's thinking about this one language system and what others feel. Oh well. Oh well. Uh, it's it's uh, it's always tricky to have this. 
because you never know. All right, how about this? Can I do it there? No. There's a question that people ask. No, let's see. Maybe I can just play like this. Sorry. I needed some groceries, so I went over to El Supermercado. And then I got back, and I realized I wanted some books, so I went to La Biblioteca. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I just... Um... All right, so you, you, get, the, you get the gist. Let that sound see. like this. I needed some groceries, so I went over to El Supermercado. And then I got back, and I realized I wanted some books, so I went to La Biblioteca. And I was hungry, so I ate some comida típica de la cultura latina. That's not what happens. That's not what we sound like. That's not what anybody sounds like. But when you put italics in a sentence, that's what it looks like. And okay. So that you get the gist, right? That this, so this is someone, not just me, I wanted to play someone else, expressing from the inside what this language repertoire looks like. So from the bilingual, it's not going from one language to the other, and you all understand that because you all are all bilingual. So, but somehow when we teach the others, we think that they're doing something different from what we do. Right? So I think this is something that we have to consider. So what I have here is um, a diagram that just shows how we are to think of bilingualism in a different kind of way. What we have traditionally thought about is the fact that there is one language system and another language system and features that are completely separate. So features, that's the F. Features for the first language, and then features from the second, for the second language. Jim Cummins, a long time ago, 1979, uh, gave us a wonderful hypothesis of what was going on, and he called this a linguistic interdependence. And what he did was he brought the two languages closer together, and he came up with what he calls a common underlying proficiency. And the idea that one can transfer the understandings that one has in one language to the understandings that one has in the second language. Notice that what we're saying is something a little bit different. What we're saying is something a little bit beyond what Jim Cummins, who has, uh, be, um, who has made so many contributions to bilingualism and bilingual education has said. What we're saying is that there is one language system which has features, of course, that we then connect to uh, the different languages. So what happens is that when we look at linguistic performances from the bilingual speaker's angle, right, we have, of course, one language repertoire, which then we learn, we all learn to do that. I've seen it here this morning, right? We learn to function either in one language or in the other. I'm sorry that this is English and the language other than English. It's only that uh, I had done this for, for something else. So, but the, the idea, of course, is that all bilinguals learn to suppress some of the features that we have in our repertoire because we want to communicate, right? So right now, I'm suppressing my Spanish, my French, right? And I'm only speaking in English, just like when you do the same, you, that's what you're doing. But that doesn't mean that it's not always present, right? That you always have those features in your head. So what learners are doing, whether you are telling them that they're only supposed to be performing in Swedish, or you're telling them at times, look, you can use your Arabic or your Farsi or your what, Fula or whatever language you have in order to show what, uh, what you know and what you do. Whatever it is that they're performing, they always are leveraging their language repertoire in the process, whether we see it or whether we don't. So that is why we speak not of language learners, but of emergent bilinguals. The idea that these voices, that this repertoire 
is always under construction and that in many ways we are all always emerging bilinguals because it depends on the situations in which we are performing and those vary and maybe many of you are quite bilingual and love to speak English and yet may not want to speak in public. So you have to remember that we're all emerging bilinguals. But the idea is that these children do not have holes, like in the, when you think about them as limited, as being deficient, as, having, as being learners, which you then have to fill the holes, right? You think of it as being separate always. But these children are uh, or these students are people whose voices are emerging, whose repertoire is growing and extending as they go along. Um, Kate and I, in a forthcoming book, have referred to this as the translanguage in corriente. Uh, Aina told me I had to change it to current to make sure you all understood. But, uh, but we refer to it as a tra uh, the translanguage in corriente. Why? Because sometimes you see this going on. In classrooms, you see it sometimes. You hear it, right? But sometimes you don't. But no matter whether you see it or you don't, it's always there. Why? Simply because all of us are bi as bilinguals have to coordinate all our language features into one linguistic performance. So in order to coordinate, we have to, of course, sometimes suppress, sometimes bring forth, but it's always present. It's a current that we have to be aware of if we teach, right? Because whether we are accessing that current or not, it's always there, and you have to remember that. And so this is where a translanguaging pedagogy comes in. And the translanguaging pedagogy simply refers to the deployment of uh, the speaker's full linguistic repertoire to learn and develop ways of using language and extend their repertoire and also to equalize positions of learners. So we like to look at the river. Notice that we're not talking about a bridge. We're not talking about going from a home language to a school language. Mm -mm. What we're talking about is the fact that when you look at a river, you see a left bank and a right bank that seem different. But underneath what you have is just one thing, right? So that is the way you have to think about it. And that is why we also, when we talk about pedagogy, then we talk about how to navigate this current, right? That's why this, there is this person in, in the kayak trying to navigate this current, right? But the idea, of course, is that uh, the, what, what we have when we work with bilingual students of any kind is what we have is one repertoire that is coming together in some way. So I'm going to um, give you some information about a project in which I'm involved. It's a, it's a big, big project. Ricardo Tegui is part of the project. He's the principal investigator, and there's a long list of people that I'm not going to go over. But this is called, we call it CUNY NYSIB. Uh, it stands for City University of New York, New York State Initiative on Emerging Bilinguals. And we have been working over the last four years with schools all over New York State uh, that have uh, a large population of emerging bilingual students. They're all different, and I'm going to speak about two of them. But before I do, I do want you to take down the website, www.cuny-nicib.org, because under the publication tab, we have put all the uh, resources that we have been able to author, and they're free. You can download them, make copies as much as you want. And I want to call especially your attention to the translanguaging guide that Kate Seltzer co-authored, which I think is full of strategies for people who want to try, try this out, because you can't do this in a presentation like this. But you have, you have a, a real wonderful guide as to the strategies that you can use. So I bring you today um, two clips, well, one clip, well, two clips about the same teacher and then another situation. 
Um, and the first one is a monolingual teacher who has been involved in this project. And he teaches in an English medium classroom. And he's teaching fifth grade, which in our case is about 10-year-olds. And his name is Andy Brown. Andy is supposedly a monolingual teacher. He does uh, speak, uh, or he has learned, he has uh, taken classes in Mandarin. Um, and he has a classroom, which is very common in, the, in New York City, that has like eight or nine languages, right? And so <clears throat> we have been working with him as to how he can approach translanguaging. The first clip that I'm going to show you is about how he has uh, put together a, a classroom that has a linguistic landscape that is multilingual, that reflects the languages of, their st of his students. And remember, this is an English class. No? Basically, oh. what I did was, after I had a couple translanguaging PD sessions, I really just you know, got obsessed with making sure anything I had in the room was written in the languages that kids would understand, whether it was Polish or Arabic, uh, Spanish, Ukrainian, and at first the kids were a little bit hesitant. They didn't like seeing things in their own language, but then I would purposely write things sort of incorrectly. And then they would correct me, and then after a while, a couple of kids actually gave me blank notebooks and said, oh, if you ever want to have a word written in Arabic or Polish, write in this book, and then I'll translate it for you. So then I get, I, that got them more involved in the process as well. I think in terms of other teachers who are maybe reluctant to do it or are wanting to try and start doing it is to really just have the kids help you 100% because trying to do it on your own, which is why I started in the beginning, was very frustrating because there's so many different ways to say certain things and asking the kids, well, what's like the way you say this word? What's, what's popular in your language to say a certain word? And they can, they can help me out that way and then they feel like they're part of the classroom and it's more of a student-run classroom than just me speaking all the time. The kids like to share what they know in their language as well. Good. Okay, so what do we see here uh, and what is Andy Brown doing? So Andy Brown is really constructing this translanguaging space in his English medium classroom. And what he's making sure is that the classroom reflects all the languages of the children and that all these ways of using language in the classroom are in conversation with each other. Remember, he uses Google Translate. Sometimes it's not perfect. You're going to see it in the next clip. Uh, but it's wonderful because then the kids are part of it. They're constructing this linguistic landscape. The, the children are really making, uh, making it work. And what is happening is that they're building metalinguistic awareness of the different languages, of the different scripts, of the directionality of the language. And they're really building tolerance towards each other. Uh, many of our immigrants bring a live in close connection with each other, in close, uh, in the same neighborhood. So they're, they're learning to understand each other. Uh, because besides learning English and starting to function in a US system, they also have to understand that this world and their neighborhoods are very, very integrated and very, very mixed, and therefore they have to be able to um, have build this tolerance towards each other. It works against the linguistic hierarchies that we all have. This is an English medium classroom, but what Andy is trying to do is he's trying to equalize the situation. It's involving not only the children, but the families, because a lot of the families come, they look around, they see Arabic, which is terribly written, and they come and correct it. So it's been a wonderful way of involving the parents also. And it's really developing these multiliteracies that all the kids need. Um, I want to play this second one, if I can. OK. And in this one, what you're going to see is you're going to see him, um, he, has, he translates the objective. Basically what I did was I would I think about a problem in English first, and I try and relate it first to the age group, of course. And um, based on the language that the kids speak, I will translate it into that language as best as possible. And usually I try not to correct anything right away or ask them beforehand if something's right or wrong, because Usually during the lesson, it's better if they see a mistake and correct me. Okay, who would like to read that out loud in English? Actually, we'll have everyone together, okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. What do you think the word in Congo means? 
Good. What do you think the word decompose means, okay? How about in Espanol? Everyone that speaks Spanish, ready on the count of three? One, two, three. Okay, ¿están correcto? That's wrong? Okay, wait. One person, one person. If you're trying to say something like decompose, you can't say that. That means like... Wait, don't say what you think it means. I want you to say, what word can I change for means? Medios. Medios? Yeah. So this is right? No, no, no. Change it. Change it to significa. No blurting out. And we got it. Can you say it one time? Significa. Significa. Okay, gracias. Okay, just having the essential question and the actual problem itself in their home languages kind of gets them more involved and engaged in the lesson. All right, and in Arabic. You ready, boys and we dad? Okay, go ahead, together. Good? No. What's wrong, Hamza? It's right? No. What, <laughs> what do we have to fix? This, this, you have to put it here. Okay, so this. And you have to write me. This is going to be over here? Yes. Okay. Here. And here, me and I know. Wait, take red. Good. And use them basically, like I said before, to get the kids engaged and to get them to understand that, you know, there are other languages besides English in the world and that it's okay for them to, you know, hold on to the ties of their own language and embrace it in, you know, a primarily English-speaking school. Okay, good. Thank you, Hamza. Okay. Good. So, you know, the question for all of us is what is Andy Brown doing here? And what he's doing, of course, is he's using translanguaging pedagogy to build on the existing language repertoire of the very different students that he has. He selects two languages every day to sort of focus on so that he doesn't translate into all the languages, but over the week he has uh, at least this very initial exercise in which the children are really teaching him uh, of these languages, and it's wonderful to see. So he's really a co-learner, right? You notice, for example, that in the first um, um, uh, translation into Spanish, he has looked up on Google Translate, and the word means is medios, but medios means like, um, 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 ba -ba -ba, like uh, what, what, do you, what does it mean? It means... Um, what? Media. Media. Thank you. All right. Great. And so he, um, but of course it means media, but it mean, and means, but of course the word is significa, and the kids tell him that it's significa the same way. So he's also, the children are really also understanding that the dictionary that we all think of as being so authoritative is not a th so authoritative at all, that you can also question the dictionary, right? Um, and uh, he's putting all these language repertoires in conversation with each other. He's not doing just Arabic or just Spanish or just English, but he's putting them in conversation with each other, which is the way in which the children experience it in the classroom. Uh, he's recognizing how difficult it is to translate. And by the way, this is very, very important because bilingual children, bilingual immigrants do this for their parents all the time, right? They have to fill out forms and the children are the ones that are, are helping them. They have to go to the doctor, they have to go to the government office, and it's usually a child who is really helping the parents. And yet that gift of translating is never acknowledged in any way. So he is working with also saying, the, your ability to translate is important. I can't do this. I, I, I'm monolingual, so he's uh, working with this. He's recognizes, recognizing that language varies. He's recognizing different scripts, uh, different literacy di directionality. He is normalizing linguistic diversity, and I think that is what's really, really important here. What he's really doing is he's saying, look, this is normal. 
This is an English medium class. We are supposed to take the exam in English, but all of this linguistic diversity is normal. Uh, and he's bringing forth the translanguage in corriente, which is there, as we say, all the time, right? But he's bringing it forth into an English language classroom. Um, so um, the second example that I have is of a teacher who is bilingual, and she's teaching in an English medium school. Um, and these are 17-year-olds, so it's 11th grade. This is a different situation. This is a school that um, we call the Pan American International High Schools. These are high schools for newcomers. Um, and you, will, you might find this difficult to really grasp. Uh, we do not in any way separate the children when they're young, but we found that when kids get to be 15, so they get into high school, um, we need special attention to them. The, the, the students were not graduating from high school. We are getting a lot of students who are what we call students with interrupted formal education. They're coming from countries that are war-torn. They're coming from very poor countries, uh, very, very low literacy in their own languages. So it's different from just teaching a second language. There is a lot more that has to be done because they don't have the background, the content understandings in order to grasp the language. So something different has to be done. So these international high schools have uh, evolved, have grown, I've written about them. Um, and. Um, at the beginning, they were supposed to work only for heterogeneous students, that is, linguistically heterogeneous. But of course, there are neighborhoods in New York City that are mostly Spanish-speaking, and uh, we all push them to think, well, what would a school look like if it was for all Spanish-speaking immigrants, all newcomers, none of them really proficient in English? And this is Camila Leiva teaching in this school. So on Mondays, she does something that she calls Rap Mondays. And Rap Mondays means that she plays music videos. And this lesson that I'm going to show you is um, a day in which she plays a music video by El Chivo of Quinto Sol and one by Eminem. Um, and if I can just go through the two vi music videos to set it up for you, um, the first one is in, mostly in Spanish. It's by a, a, a Mexican group from Los Angeles, even though they were born in the United States. It's mostly in Spanish, but it's of course about the idea that they are deporting undocumented immigrants and they're separating families. It's a call to action. Uh, it starts with someone, a white man who wears a shirt that says, speak English, and it ends and says things like, I'll tell you the truth about illegal aliens. Immigration is out of control. We got to do something. And then it ends with children who wear a T-shirt that says, born in the United States, um, and who are then um, writing posters to go to a, a demonstration uh, in favor of uh, making sure that their parents are not deported. And they're writing posters both in English and in Spanish, saying things like, if you take my mother, it will hurt my heart. Um, so this is the first one. And then the second one, you may know this one by Eminem, it's called Mosh. And it's, it was against the policies of then President George Bush on the war in Iraq. And it starts by uh, having school children in English um, write, um, say the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And he compares that, of course, with the deaf ears of then President George Bush, W. Bush, uh, the US Supreme Court in this case, and Congress to the pleas of the people against the war in Iraq. So this is what she sets up. Um, I was gonna do this, but I'm not going to do it because it will take too long, but I was just gonna show you the lyrics because they are, it's a call to action and it's very, very relevant to the lives of these students who many of them are undocumented themselves, they have no papers, and therefore they're worried about 
the separation, the deport deportation of their parents, um, and also war, of course, it's a big topic in the United States these days. Uh, so, but thinking about it from a language education perspective, so what is happening? One of the things that she does is, of course, is in listening and viewing simultaneously, she is contextualizing language for these children, for these students, right? So that they're not all not understanding. It's the language is contextualized through the videos, through something that they're used to, through language that they're used to. And of course, she's deconstructing the idea that they are autonomous languages because she exposes them to different language practices, rapping, and then spoken language, some in English, some in Spanish, slang, right? And what she's doing is she's calling for unity. She's calling them to be unidos. Unidos todos is the, the um, refrain of the Si Se Puede, uh, which of course means Yes We Can, the first music video that she exposes them to. The idea, of course, that these students, who again have limited literacy even in Spanish, have a tough time. They have to really unite in order to make sense of their education. And the idea that this, it's a continuum, that not all the students are again, at the same level, even if they just arrived yesterday. Some of them have better education in, in their home countries than others. So there's a continuum, uh, and that uh, therefore she has to offer different entry points into the lesson. It cannot all be at the same time. And she's always telling them, of course, that El Chivo, who is funny because his name is El Chivo of Quinto Sol, no, El Chivo de Quinto Sol. El Chivo was born in Los Angeles, but he's rapping in Spanish. And, he, and Eminem also was born in the United States, but he's moving back and forth between slang and not. So she's always telling them all this. Then there is dialogue and discussion after they listen to the music video for a few times. And of course, in, she has them work in groups collaboratively, and the students are constantly translanguaging with each other, making sense of what they've just heard, right? So they're asking questions of each other. Some of them, the lesson is in English, remember this, but some of them using all English, some of them using a little bit of English, some of them using English and Spanish, some of them using Spanish only, depending on where they're at, but they are walk, working together. And in the discussion with the teachers, the, the students are also translanguaging in order to participate. iPads are out all the time. The iPads are great because they, they give you access to meaning immediately. It's not like having to look something up in a dictionary. The teacher is all constantly making these links to translanguaging and also to transculturation. You know, people think of these students, well, they're all Spanish speakers, they're all the same. No, nonsense. There are 21 countries. Uh, they're all different. They come from very different cultures, some more indigenous, some more African, so that th this is actually a way also of building uh, a pan-Hispanic identity in the United States. So it's, uh, that's, all of that's going on. How about literacy? She then gives them parts of the music videos the one in Spanish, and she asks them to translate them into English, and then the one in English, and she asks them to translate it into Spanish. Now, the idea here is not to offer a perfect translation. She knows that they cannot, as a matter of fact, they can't do it into English, and some of them can't do it into Spanish either, because remember, many of these students have interrupted incomplete um, education in Spanish also. So by working this way, she's not on, only developing their English language proficiency, but also developing their Spanish literacy in an English medium classroom. And this is what you have to remember, right? Because she knows that in order to move them forward in English, she can only do it in interrelationship with the features that they have, to, they have from Spanish, and therefore she has to develop also their Spanish features in an English medium classroom, and that's where the translanguaging comes in. So she, they're discussing of the readings using translanguaging, they're doing translation, and again, different entry points to writing so that not all of them 
are translating whole. Sometimes they know one word in English, and that's a word they write in English, and they just copy from Spanish to Spanish and, and the opposite. So all of them are doing different kinds of things. One of the things that is happening is that they are um, also acquiring this greater metalinguistic awareness, the idea that uh, uh, the power of language practices that are not the dominant when the speakers are all together. So the, pra the power of Spanish, giving them back the power of their own language, um, not saying that this is not something that they can't do. Awareness of, of these different language practices. Awareness also that the standard language, both in Spanish and in English, are constructed, right? They're artificial. They're stuff that we do in school, but it's not the stuff that we work with uh, usually. So they, students really need to develop this awareness for that, that standard language has also been constructed. Awareness of this complexity of bilingualism and how difficult it is and how we never finish having it, right? We never have language, we do language, we perform language in different situations. And the idea that, again, we have to draw on the student's full linguistic repertoire, repertoire to perform with features desired in formal school settings, because after all, that's what schools are doing, right? We are making sure that they are performing with those features that we desire in schools so they can pass tests, they can graduate, they can be successful participants. But in order to do that, we cannot do that by imposing only that standard. We have to do, build it with the features that they already have. So another thing that is happening through this Rap Monday that she does is she, she's really creating this trans subject, neither just Spanish speaking nor neither just English speaking, but a trans subject because we are really changing the perspectives and the terms through which conversations are had. We are bringing someone else into the conversation, right? So translanguaging also for social justice. At the end, she, asked, she gives them a Venn diagram and she asks them to put together the things that Eminem says that are different from the things that El Chivo says, and then to write in the middle what is it's the same. And it's always interesting to see what languages the students select in order to do that exercise, usually both. So what is it that then translanguaging enables? It equalizes the distance between the home language practices and those desired in schools. It liberates and includes the multilingual voices of speakers that have been constrained or repressed in schools. It normalizes multilingual use uh, and multilingual speakers and multilingual audiences. And, it is, and this is very, very important. Translanguaging for these two teachers is much more than a simple scaffold. They're not just using translanguaging to scaffold into English. What they're doing is they're using translanguaging as an expressive transformational vehicle. That is, by including this different way of looking at language, we are really changing the conversations. We are transforming society also. And this is important, right? It's not just a scaffold, it is transformational, right? And I think, I think this is really very important. So what we are doing through translanguaging is reframing the question. We started out with a question, how do I teach Swedish as a second language to children, adolescents, and adults, right? And I think what we are saying is that the question has to change to how do I engage students, right? And the engagement is very important. It's not language that we're teaching, we're teaching students, we're teaching people. So how do we engage the people, not the language, but the people, and how do we engage them in appropriating the language features associated with Swedish into their own unique language repertoire. Not how do you teach them Swedish as a second language, but how do we get them to appropriate those language features into their own unique repertoire. I'm going to, to answer the, that question, of course, 
Uh, what I have offered is a translanguaging pedagogy, uh, acknowledging, of course, that there is this translanguaging corriente all the time, and that well, we have to learn to navigate it and to move forward with it, right? And Andy and Camila's translanguaging pedagogy is really based in three, on three elements. And uh, I'm not going to do this because Kate Seltzer is going to go into detail with this. But what we have said is that teachers need three things. They need to have a stance, a firm belief that this is important, that, that there are no language forms that you can just add um, forget yours, but what there are are language features, affordances of language practices that you can then integrate into, uh, into a, an, ex an extended repertoire. So the stance has to be there, the philosophical belief that this is possible, that these students deserve to uh, be able to work in this way. That is first. Without that, you can't move forward. Second one is you have to have a design. It can't just be haphazard. You have to know when you're using translanguaging and why you're using translanguaging. It has to be strategic. It cannot be random. You have to know why. And that is why in the book that Kate and I have authored, we have a lesson design, a unit design, so that you have from the beginning a language objective, a content objective, and a translanguaging objective for which you plan. It cannot be unplanned. And third, you have to be able to shift. Any of us who teach um, newcomers or who teach uh, languages other than the dominant ones, uh, speakers of uh, minoritized languages, know that even if you have a perfect lesson that is sequential in some way, tomorrow someone arrives who doesn't speak a word of Swedish or English or whatever. So you have to then be able to, once you have your design, be able to shift for that student or be able to shift at times when the situation demands it. So, um, I think what I want to end with is just to tell you that this translanguaging pedagogy can really assist us in answering the transform question that we have been working with now of how to really engage students in appropriating the language features of Swedish into their language repertoire. Y muchas gracias por haberme dado la oportunidad de hablar con ustedes. Y buena suerte, you are the people that make it happen. So thank you for all your work. Uh, with these students. Muchas gracias.